Okay, let's, uh, let's make a start, folks. It's 8.45, and those of you who've been to these events before, we have been advertising an 8.30 start, and typically 8.45 seems to be the, uh, the sweet spot in terms of the actual start time. So maybe it's a bit of breakfast first, and then, and then we start. Uh, so good morning, uh, and welcome today uh, to this session, which I suppose is correctly called jargon busting, uh, deciphering the language of finance. Uh, my name is Raj Sood. Um, I look after all of the uh, graduate and intern training that we do uh, at Fitch Learning. Um, and those of you who've been to these events before um, know that these are events are about uh, inviting in, uh, well, anybody really, uh, from our clients, uh, learning and development, HR, any of our contacts, um, to get something back for the fact that you uh, already spending money with us uh, buying training for other people. Um, here's an opportunity to get something for yourselves. Uh, so certainly later on, uh, at the end of the session, I'll be asking you, well, what else can we do? What else? What other sessions would you like us, uh, like us to do? Um, this session uh, was, a, was a slightly difficult one uh, to, to, to pitch, uh, you know, to, to kind of entice you in. It seems to have worked reasonably well here. There's a, a decent, decent turnout today. Um, that was what I kind of thought it should maybe be called. Uh, that's kind of what I anticipate it might be about. Um, but I thought, well, that's, that's not really going to tease you in, is it? Accounting 101. That's, uh, that's a bit of a turn off. Um, I did wonder about that. Uh, everything you wanted to know about accounting but were afraid to ask. Not overly catchy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say. Um, and I ran, I ran this one by Alice as well, uh, my, my marketing manager. Uh, she thought that was a bit offensive. Uh, accounting for dummies, so we, we haven't gone, gone with that one either. So we went with the, went with the original one. Uh, we're going to do some jargon busting today. Uh, and I think the question uh, for you guys, um, and I don't mean this in, a, in an existential sense, not too philosophical, philosophical um, but why are you here? What was it about that invitation uh, that grabbed you? You know, what bit of financial jargon uh, was in your head? You thought, well, actually, I wouldn't mind trying to get that clarified uh, today. Um, so, and this is the kind of thing I would do um, in the classroom typically, is just ask my audience to think about, well, you know, why am I here? What is it I do want to get out of this, this session? So there's some post-it notes uh, in front of you uh, and some marker pens. Can I get you to take as many of those as you need and just write on them um, what terminology, what concepts, um, ideally you'd like to get out of today? You don't have to put your name on it, so uh, if you put down something Ridiculous, no one's going to know it was you. I will be kind of watching, I suppose. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't ha we may not be able to cover everything, but I want to know what you would like to get out of this session. So what terms, what concepts? Try and put a separate term on each post-it note. I know that's not great for the uh, environment, but um, forgive me. Okay, so take one post-it note per concept or term. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll read them out, um, and I'll probably I'll stick them on my three charts. Um, this chart will be for, great, fantastic, I'm glad you've asked that, because that's what we were meant to cover today. Uh, this chart for, uh, wasn't planning on covering that, but I can probably squeeze something in on that one. Uh, and then the last chart will be, great, you've given us inspiration for another event, yeah? So that you'll have to, you'll have to wait till, till part two. Ooh, I'll think about those. Um, okay, first one, underlying profit and profit before tax. Uh, that definitely goes on there. I know you can't read these. Market regulation, I think we'll have to go over here. Uh, that's a, an enormous topic. Uh, CFTC regulated swaps, that's a big topic for financial products. I'll have to put over there. Uh, reporting loss or gains on securities, probably put that in the middle, but it may nudge over. Dodd-Frank, definitely in the kind of regulation area over there. Uh, Deriv okay, derivatives, that's definitely out of scope today, but I, can, I, I know a couple of people have done that, so that's worth a definition. EMEA, I think we need a regulation session. Basel three, blimey. I can touch on Basel, I suppose, uh, but I might be lucky to get that in. LBO, I can at least define. Uh, DCF, that's interesting. Uh, it's a big topic. I'll at least define that for us and so you've got something to take away. Uh, EBITDA is very safe. I don't know what that says. NIA-T or NIA-7? 
Oh, net income after tax. Okay. Uh, P&L versus balance sheet. VAR, that's a good one. So value at risk. Kind of belongs over there, but a, a, a definition at least. Uh, origination. Probably has to go there, I'm afraid. FX. That's huge. It depends what you want to know about FX, I suppose. I'll put it in the middle. Uh, derivatives again. Uh, balance sheet. General ledger. P&L. Derivatives again. We're definitely going to have to run a session on that. Uh, P&L. Derivatives again. We'll have to scrap what I planned. Then this, then this one, I don't know what that is. CRD4. You stitched me up. Uh, leverage finance and leverage again. Okay. We'll get these terms in along the way. All right, so there's some disappointed people uh, over on the, on the far flip chart. If, if all of your stickers are over there, I'll understand if you grab a croissant and, uh, and depart. Um, I hope there's still something you can get out of the, out of the session all the same. So, so my focus is going to be uh, on, on the topics on here, and I'll bring in as many as I can over here. So a lot of the kind of accounting, uh, income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, we'll make sure all that's really clear for you. Um, and then dip into as many of the other financial terms as we can uh, in, that, in that middle chart. Uh, so I think I'm glad I asked that question, although there's, there's a few, few curveballs there. Okay, so, so this is probably a good start, a, a place to start. And it's, uh, I guess I'll tell you a, a kind of a secret, really. Uh, that, and there are some of my colleagues are here as well, so I need them to be a little bit more uh, discreet than they might normally be. Um, so I have to, so, so being in training is not terribly lucrative. I don't make a lot of money. Thank you, Simon. Uh, ah, um, so remember that next time you're negotiating with us. Uh, I don't make a lot of money. Um, so I have to have a sideline business. Okay, so I run a, a sideline business uh, near where I live. And that's, uh, what, what's, this, what's that green line there? It's a district line. Uh, so I live on the district line, uh, right about there in Southfields, uh, and that's a picture of my house. Uh, that's a picture of my house in, in Southfields, uh, and I just wanted, does anyone know that area actually? Anyone familiar with Southfields? Yeah? Uh, so you know, if you're a Wimbledon fan, that's not, you know, Wimbledon Tennis is, is near there. And it's just full of these, uh, you know, Victorian terraced houses. It's very densely populated, and that's, that's important. I need, I need to tell you that because um, that's where my customers are. All these uh, families, uh, particularly elderly people, those are my customers for my, for my little business. Um, and I run the business at weekends. Uh, I can't encroach on my normal day job, obviously. Uh, so at the weekends, uh, I buy these things. Uh, I buy TVs uh, from a local supplier. Um, so they call it the grid where I live, because all of the, the streets form that kind of grid pattern. Uh, so there's a local TV supplier. So I go along, I buy one of these TVs, um, and then guess what? I go and I knock on doors, and I kind of sell these things uh, door to door. What do you think about that as a business model? Like the sound of that? Would you invest? If it was Dragon's Den, would you invest in? No? Lots of cynics. OK, all right, a bit more information then. Um, I'm buying these TVs uh, for 100 quid each. All right, so I pay 100 pounds. Uh, anything else you'd like to know? How much? So you don't care about the features of the TV, uh, what it does, how much, how much am I selling them for? I sell them for £200 each. What do you think about my business model now? Mm. Not still not impress some of you. Uh, I've probably got less shakes of the head uh, this time around. So I buy TVs for £100 each. Uh, I sell TVs uh, for £200 each. OK. Um, well, let's look at last week. Um, and last week, uh, alone, I bought 10 TVs, state-of-the-art, uh, top-end uh, television sets. They're very, very good. Um, and I sold, right, so I bought 10, uh, and I sold five, just in last week alone. So what happened, in summary, I bought 10 TVs for £100 each, I sold five TVs for £200 each. What's the question I'm going to ask you? Oh, how much profit have I made? How much profit have I made? Uh, so I'd like each of you to take another post-it note, and this time, if you remember your school days, secretly write on that piece of paper how much profit I have made. Now, the secretism is important here. No copying, no discussion, no sharing of answers. 
If this seems ridiculously easy, good. If it seems ridiculously hard, also good. That's not the point. So nice and secretly, just write down your, your answer for me. So there were lots of zeros. How many said zero? 13. Uh, there were quite a few 500, well, a couple of 500. How many were there? Three? 1,000? One. And there was a five TVs in there, wasn't there? From Adam, who's my, my star, star of the week. Um, OK, so there's a definite skew towards that top answer. Um, why is Adam the star of the week? Uh, I love that answer, five TVs. Um, well, what did I have in the first place? I guess I had some money in my pocket so I could go out and buy TVs. Um, I bought TVs, I sold TVs, and at the end of a week, okay, financially I'm in the same situation, aren't I? I haven't really changed, I haven't really got anything different except for five TVs. Yeah? You see, can you see that? What's the only thing that's changed about me after seven days is I've got five TVs. I love that answer, therefore I've made a profit of five TVs. But many of you could see that and didn't write that down because you might see those five TVs differently. H how else could we interpret those five TVs? I could return them and get my money back. True. But the, for the time being, they are mine. May not be able to sell them. That's true. But I'm a very good salesman. As you can imagine, I'm sure, Joanne. Sorry? I can keep them as inventory. Anyone else familiar with that term? Inventory or stock or the word asset? Do we, could we associate those words with these, with these TVs? Does that feel right? That, that, just, that feels right, doesn't it? These TVs are not the profit. These are an asset now of my business. In effect, I've bought TVs and they belong to my business. They are an asset. Yeah? Um, okay, so they're an asset. Um, and what type of asset are they? They are, a, well, I won't leap in too far. Inventory. If you want to use the, the more current and international language, it's inventory. Some of you might be a bit more old school and refer to those TVs as stock. Yeah, same thing. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. OK, that's, that's useful. And I'm going to note that. But unfortunately, wrong answer. Uh, I love this answer because it's the biggest number. Uh, 1,000. And I guess there's a few ways we can get to 1,000. Um, I certainly generated revenue of 1,000, didn't I? I sold five TVs at 200 each. That's 1,000. Here's another way of looking at how I could have got to 1,000. Um, what, what am I doing? I'm buying TVs for 100 each. Yeah. Um, I'm selling TVs for 200 each. How many were there in total? There were 10 in total. So I bought 10 TVs for 100 each. That's 1,000. I sell 10 TVs for 200 each. That's 2,000. 2,000 minus 1,000 is 1,000. It's 1,000 of profit, isn't it? This whole venture, this whole activity of buying 10 TVs generates a thousand of profit. Discuss. Market value of your inventory. Oh, okay, very nice. It's a valuation of that inventory. Market value, a thousand, because they will sell at, uh, at 200 each. I'll come back to that point. What do you think about my idea of I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell 10 TVs, 2,000 each. Uh, those, ten, those 10 TVs cost me 100 each, therefore the overall profit's 1,000. How do you feel about me recording 1,000 in my accounts? Can I do it? There's the problem, right? I've, whoops, I've got uh, five TVs that I haven't sold yet. So as much as I want to record 1,000 as my profit, I can't because I've only sold 10 of them. And that might seem... Ridiculous. You might think, well, that's common sense, what I'm saying there. But actually, businesses do attempt to do that. Uh, do you remember Enron? Do you remember the Enron story? Yeah. You know, massive uh, US firm that collapsed. One thing that they were doing, in a huge way, was recording future revenues, revenues they hadn't even earned yet in, the, in today's accounts. In, in some cases, they hadn't even come up with the technology yet. They were, they were just making stuff up. They were saying, oh, one day we'll be able to do this, and it will generate this much revenue. Therefore, we'll record that in our accounts today. It's just ridiculous, really. Um, because we can't do that. We can't anticipate future revenues. Okay. So that is not the answer either. Let me come back to Simon's point, though, about how uh, our inventory has got this market value of 1,000. How confident are you, are we, that we'll get £200 each for each TV? Yeah, good. I like the way you think. Um, I have just sold uh, five of them for 200 quid each. So there is some evidence there. Um, what's another angle, though? B 
Be more cynical than Simon. Right? Things could change. Things could change. Uh, and, you know, what happens to the TVs that I've got? So maybe they're not worth a thousand. What's, what's another figure we could take? A realistic, sensible figure. What could we take? What we paid for them. So uh, the cost. So we could take the cost. Now, what do you think the accountants do? Which of those figures do you think they take? Our accountants, uh, exciting, dynamic people who like to be really positive and take the best, best news possible, uh, or they're slightly more cautious and pessimistic. Probably the latter, right? So they take the lower, and that's. Uh, by the way, I'm an accountant, so I'm not uh, not being too dismissive of that profession. Um, so 500 is the answer. So when it to, when it comes to showing. Uh, inventory in a set of accounts, they're shown at cost. Now that's not true of all assets, so, so I'm not giving you a rule for the whole of a balance sheet, I know that's a term I haven't used yet, um, but I'm giving you a rule for inventory. We take the lower number, but there are some assets we do actually show at market value. Okay. So certain financial uh, assets. Property, for example, as well. You might say, well that, that property We've had it for 20 years. We paid a tiny amount 20 years ago. It's worth an awful lot now. Couldn't we show that at its valuation instead? Yeah, you can. There are rules to allow that. Yeah. Um, OK, so it's not 1,000. It's not five TVs. Um, so I've got two answers left, one that's more popular than the other. So of course, the answer must be that one and not that one. It's not zero. The answer is actually 500. So there are three of you who can be very smug. And you'll try and hold that in as best you can. Um, but there's lots of us a bit confused. You know, uh, I had zero. Zero seemed like an obvious answer. Uh, I bought these 10 TVs. Uh, I sold five of them. That was 1,000 going out uh, and 1,000 coming in. I know, I know what 1,000 minus 1,000 is. I didn't even reach for the calculator. That's obviously zero, but something, something went a bit wrong. Um, so let's think about it. Let's think about how uh, an income statement might be formed. What's the other word for income statement? The, what's, the, what's the old school term? p and &L. And what does p and stand for? Profit and loss account, yeah. So, I, you, I mean, people will still talk about profit and loss account, uh, but when these things are published, you will see the term income statement. Um, so this is an income statement for my business for that particular week. What did I sell? Five TVs at 200 each. I don't think anyone in the room has got any doubts about that line there. That's quite straightforward. What, what catches us out is the second line. Typically called cost of sales, some accountants will call it cost of goods sold. And actually, that's a, that's a really good way of helping us think about what that number should be. Cost of goods sold. What was the cost of the goods that were sold? What was the cost of the goods that were sold? 500, right? Because we sold five TVs, and they each cost 100 each. So actually, this line is not 1,000, it's 500. And that might frustrate some of you. Yeah, but we bought 10 TVs. Doesn't matter. This is, this, is, uh, this is art. This isn't science. This is art. We get to make rules up. So there are accounting rules that say, shouldn't these costs match the revenues that are being generated? Yeah. So we're generating revenue here. If we're going to show the right story, the right picture, we should show the costs that were used to generate that revenue. So now the, that kind of matches up. And so what do we get? We get a profit. Of, of 500. Should we have a round of applause for the three people who were... Messing? See who's not clapping. Have a look who's not clapping. Uh, so, that's, that's, so excellent, that's very good. Um, now, just if you, in case you don't like that, just reflect for a moment and think, well, I told you I bought and sold TVs and you didn't really love that idea. But then I told you I bought them for 100 and sold them for 200. And that kind of sounds better. That sounds like a profitable business, doesn't it? I am making a profit when I sell a TV. So it kind of doesn't make sense then if when I sell TVs I show a set of accounts that does not make a profit. So, so I, I don't know, let, let that idea be there as well. 
Um, now, you might be thinking, well, well, where are those TVs? Where are those other TVs that we bought? Yeah. So I, I bought 10, sold five of them. I've shown five here in my income statement. Where are the other five TVs? You're quite right. In, in my house in Southfields. In my financial statements, where are they? On my balance sheet, this thing called a balance sheet. And what are they called on my balance sheet? Inventory. inventory. They're in inventory on my, on my balance sheet. Um, so, if I, so if I go back, we talked about them already. It's this inventory at 500 each. So it's there. They're in my accounts. They're just not in my income statement yet. When do you think they will go in my income statement? When I sell them. When I sell those TVs, they, go, they pass through the income statement. So think of the balance sheet as a kind of a holding area. It's my lounge. The balance sheet is my lounge holding on to those TVs until I sell them. And when I sell them, they, they pass through the income statement. The income st statement is to tell you what happened in a particular period of time. What period of time normally? A day, a week, a month? A year. A year. Yeah. We talk, if we talk about financial statements that are produced that lots of people will look at, um, we're talking about a year. Can you produce an income statement for a different period? Can, can't you? Any period you like. And all the businesses that you work for um, will produce income statements for much shorter periods. Um, I would suggest the, the shortest would be a, a month, probably. Um, in some businesses, daily P&Ls, weekly P&Ls, individual P&Ls for people. Yeah, for a trader, what's my P&L for the day? Have I made a profit or a loss today based on what I've, what I've done? Yeah. But yeah, annual uh, financial statements will, will include an annual income statement. OK, good stuff. Um, what about a balance sheet? Is a balance sheet over, you know, for, for a year, for a week, for a month? How, what, what's, how can I compare a balance sheet? Yeah, good. So our balance sheet, it was telling us how many TVs I've got, how many TVs I've got. So that doesn't really work over a year because I'll have different numbers of TVs every day or every minute of that year. So it's a single moment in time and people talk about snapshot. In fact, I can pretty much guarantee if you Google balance sheet, you'll get the word snapshot in the definition somewhere because it's that one moment in time. Right, right now, as at today, what assets have we got? What liabilities have we got? What equity have we got? And we'll have, to, we'll have to do some work to define those things. Yeah. So, so, so a balance sheet. Um, the name of that's going to change as well. Statement of financial position. You'll, in terms of annual, I don't think businesses will talk about a statement of financial position. I think we'll still talk about balance sheets. But when you see annual financial statements, uh, we'll see that term changing. So our, where, does our, where does our inventory go? Assets, liabilities, or equity? Assets. So our inventory, <coughs> these are my uh, TVs, go here, assets, uh, 500. Yeah. Uh, where does cash go on the balance sheet? Assets, liabilities, or equity? It, I, it, might, it might sound like a trick question. Think about yourselves. Do you think of cash that you've got as an asset, or is it a liability? Sorry? It is an asset. You, I guess you might be wondering where you've got that cash from. Um, and do you have to give it back to somebody? Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't know how much cash we've got, but we've got some cash. Uh, but, so let me ask you a different question. Then. What about your overdraft? Some of you might, might be familiar with what an overdraft is. I am. Uh, what's an overdraft? When you owe a bank money. So where does that go? Liabilities? Yeah, so I think my overdraft goes down here. Mortgage? You know, I bet you all produce your own balance sheet every evening, don't you? See how you're doing. That's another liability, right? Mortgage. Um, okay, what about the companies that you work for? Uh, will have, well, might have inventory, they might not. Uh, cash, they might have some, some loans. What about, what about you lot? What about the staff? Where do you, where do you feature? Are you an asset? Or are you a liability? Where do you feature on this balance sheet? Or is it one of Raj's trick questions? So what's the definition of an asset? What is an asset? Put some more things up. So property might go up here. 
Investments. What's the definition of an asset? Give me a simple definition. Wonderful. Something that holds a positive value for you. That's, that's wonderful. Um, and, and if we go more technical, it's something that actually will generate some value for you. It, it will give you some kind of income stream in the future. If you want to go simpler, maybe it's something that you own. That's probably too simple, but you know, we're not, we're not you know, all accountants in here, so maybe that will do. The assets are the things that you own or will generate some revenue for you, gener generate some benefit for you in the future. And I think all of those things fit into that. So what's a liability? Asset is something that you own, so a liability is something that you owe, I guess. It's something that you owe to somebody. At a, a nice kind of simple level. There might be a bit more to it. What about this equity term? What's that? What's equity? Shares. Um, the, this is the share capital, or common stock, where investors have put money into the business, yeah. they've put capital into the business. Um, so some of you will own shares in a company. Um, well, you might have bought those shares directly from the company. Um, so some of you <coughs> might have been involved in the Royal Mail IPO. So you might have bought shares directly from Royal Mail, giving Ma Royal Mail cash in exchange for shares. Some of you might own shares, that you, ha you didn't buy directly from the company, you bought them from someone else. Well, you're not putting money into the company. Someone else did. Someone else did originally. Yeah? So if you bought Facebook shares yesterday, you've bought them, I might have bought them from Tom, for example. It was Tom that gave Mark Zuckerberg the money in the first place. Yeah, does that make sense? Um, in that, through, you know, through, that, through that IPO. OK, so there's a balance sheet uh, with some, you know, some words on it. I know where inventory fits in. Um, and there'll be different categories within uh, the, with, you know, subheadings here, but that's okay. Um, why is it called a balance sheet? It has to balance. It has to balance. It has to balance. Uh, and you know, for me, that's a very important thing as, a, as an accountant. Um, ale, assets, liabilities, uh, and equity. Um, and I guess you can carve this up in different ways. Um, typically, we're seeing balance sheets laid out like this. The assets equal the liabilities plus the equity. Most balance sheets you see will look like that. Assets all grouped together and liabilities and equity all grouped together. They don't have to look like that. Uh, it could be assets minus liabilities equal equity. And if you're mathematical, you'll see other ways of rearranging that. Um, but in terms of what you're generally going to see, it's that. Okay. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any balance sheet related questions? When you say your mortgage goes up, no. Yeah, good. Because if your mortgage goes up, that's me going to the bank and saying, "I'd like to borrow some more money, please. Can you give me more money? I will have more of something else. So I'll actually have more cash." So that goes there. And I mean. We shouldn't get into this, but um, the reason the balance sheet balances is because you cannot put just one number into a balance sheet. You've got to change at least two things, and that rule means that it must always balance. Yeah. So you've, you're always changing two things. So when you borrow money from the bank, I've got more debt, but I've also got more cash. What if I spend the cash on property? Okay, I have less cash, but I have more property. Yeah. So there's always, there's always different things going on, there's different dynamics going on, so it's this constant fluctuating, but it will always stay balanced, no matter what. Don't try and break a balance sheet, can't do it. Or I'll, I'll get freaked out if you do. Okay, any other balance sheet related questions? Okay, um, is that true? Do we all know what depreciation is? We do, don't we? Everyone knows what depreciation is. Uh, who's going to tell me, though, what depreciation is? Uh, so Sophie said um, it's to do with um, assets falling in value over time. And what example did you give? Property. Property. Uh, but not like a car. Like a car. Sorry. So a car could lose value over time, and our accounts will reflect that. 
Who agrees with that definition? Show, show, show of hands for Sophie to make her feel confident. All right. <coughs> it's wrong. Okay. Um, well, it's not wrong. For non-accountants, it's right, isn't it? That's, that's the way, it's exactly how we all think about depreciation. We think about something losing value, don't we? I, I, just, I bought a car last week, it's depreciating already. Yes, the moment I drove it off the forecourt, it's depreciating. I don't know why I'm doing that voice. Uh, <laughs> that's how people talk when they buy a car. Uh, it depreciates, it's losing value. We talk about that, don't we? We talk about assets that depreciate, we talk about losing value. But accountants and finance people don't agree. That, they don't agree with that, with that language. Okay, so let, let, me, let me try and explain. Um, so uh, my business um, is expanding. Um, so I'm going to sell more and more TVs, uh, and I'm gonna, or, or at least more frequently anyway. Uh, and I'm getting a bad back from shifting these TVs from house to house. So um, I need a van. Uh, so that will do. That will do as my, as my van. Uh, so right now I can load up. Uh, TVs uh, into there and I can drive them around the Southfields grid and maybe I can go to Wimbledon Park and Putney uh, and expand my operation a little bit. Uh, how much does the mystery machine cost? 30 grand. Whew. Is that a bit rich? It's a nice, it's a nice, nice van. Uh, okay, so I just want to scale up my business. So um, we did a thousand of revenue uh, in a week. Do you all agree with that? Remember that? So, agree, 52,000 in a year? I don't, I don't holiday, I, I work hard. Uh, so, 52,000 in a year. You're happy with the second line as well? Um, it's, it's half of the top line. Every TV costs, uh, you know, 100. Uh, yeah, is that right? Happy, happy with that? Um, and so, therefore, my gross profit is, is 26,000. Is that okay for everybody? So, if I now include... Did I put a slide in on this? Whew. If I include my van purchase in there... Um, I'm going to have a cost of 30,000 and a loss of 4,000, okay? So it now seems like a very bad idea buying that van. Do you agree? Just on the face of that, that income statement there, that seems like a very bad idea. Even though, if it wasn't for that van, I wouldn't have been able to do it. My, my back was bad, remember? I've got a lot of TV to deliver. Um, even though it was a, bad, a, a good idea to grow the revenue, it's given me a loss at the bottom isn't very attractive. Now let's assume the next year uh, my van's still working uh, and I'm just able to keep up exactly the same level of trade. What will the business look like? I'll have 52,000 of revenue, 26,000 of cost, 26,000 of gross profit, no van purchase and 26,000 of profit at the bottom. What do you think about that? It's pretty impressive. Is that right though? Is it telling the same bit? Take the same picture. How did I generate this revenue here? Well, I got into my van, I drove around, I picked up TVs, I drove them to customers. How did I generate my revenue here? Got into my van, drove to my supplier, picked up TV. The business is exactly the same in the two years, and yet, loss, big profit. It, it doesn't make sense. Even though that van was bought here, I am still using it here. Yeah, does that make sense? So this is where depreciation comes in. We, we don't care about the value of the van. We care about something else. C can you guess what I'm going to do next? Can you anticipate what I'll, what I'll do next? Spread that 30,000 out. Spread that 30,000 out. Just make up uh, a life for a van. How long will my van last? You can say anything you like now. You can say, you could say a million years if you want to, um, which, which would be kind of not ideal. Uh, you could say 10 years, and, and I'll, actually I'll answer this. Um, it, the accountants wouldn't like that. They would probably think that's too long, because you've got to come up with something sensible now. Uh, so we, van, 10 years, you're not going to keep it for 10 years or use it for 10 years. Uh, you'll have worn that van out. You know, a, commercial, a commercial, commercially used vehicle, uh, that, that probably wouldn't be allowed. Um, so what would be, give me a range of something more acceptable. That's one number. Give me another. Give me a range. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah so maybe three at the bottom end. Two would be is possible, but three might be more sensible. I don't. Yeah, up to maybe six, something like that. Something like that. So we'll take a thirty thousand van. Uh, we'll divide it by five five years, and I get six thousand. Yeah, happy with that? 
You, that's not the only way to calculate depreciation, but it's the most common, uh, and it's clearly the easiest as well. Um, so I take that 6,000, that's my depreciation charge, and I now plug that into my income statement. So the top three lines haven't changed. I'm now going to take that 30,000 of van costs, and instead of putting it through in one year, I'm going to put it through in five years. So gradually take that cost of 6,000 each year. Does that make sense? Yeah. Giving me a profit at the bottom of 20,000. What will my profit be next year? Assuming I s still sell the same number of TVs. The same. Exactly the same. And that's why we have depreciation. That's why accountants love depreciation. Because it smooths the income statement. Accountants don't like... <laughs> they, call, they call them lumpy. They don't like lumpy profit and loss accounts or uh, fluctuating or volatile. We like smoothness. And that spreading out the cost of that van gives us that smoothness. If we didn't do that, we'd have volatility. We don't like volatility. We like smoothness. Okay. Is it a true reflection of what's happened? Probably not. But we don't care. Not when we produce an income statement. We are, we, this is art. This isn't science. This is art. Let's, let's try and present the pic, a picture that makes sense. You know, because up here, did we buy five TVs? No, we bought ten. Down here, did we buy a van for 6,000? No, it cost us 30,000. It's not telling us the full story. What might give us a better picture? What kind of statement might give us a better picture? A cash flow statement might give us a better picture. Or may, maybe I should say another picture. So if you go back to the original TV scenario, um, I buy 10 TVs for 100 each, and I sell 5 TVs for 200 each, what's the cash flow? And tip, clue, think about the number that 13 of you wrote down earlier on. Cash flow is zero, right? Do you all agree? And that's why you wrote zero because you were thinking of the cash flow. So you don't need to be humiliated and embarrassed. You were thinking of the cash flow. And there is such a thing as cash accounting. So you, you can do it on that basis. It pretty much never happens. You, you know, a small business would do that. A window cleaner would cash account. Uh, but nobody else really does. Um, so our cash flow at that level um, is zero, at least in that first year. Uh, or if I rewind to when it was just one week anyway. Um, and what about if we take into account that van purchase? How would my cash flow look in that first year? D don't give me a number, good or bad. Quite bad, wouldn't it? There would be this big outflow of cash. So we, we, we need to look at both. We need to look at the income statement and a cash flow. So in, in, in kind of banking terms, in valuation terms, in credit terms, um, we've got to look at both. And arguably, we don't look at the cash flow uh, enough, I would suggest. Okay. Does that make sense? Ah, there seems to be a problem. Okay, that's, what's the problem? I can't afford a van. That seems to be the problem. So how do we get around that? In business, uh, in personal lives, I suppose, how do we get around that? When you can't afford something, what do you do? I guess you've got two, shop, two options. Not do it, not have it, or borrow the money. Yeah? And what do companies do? They borrow money. Is it bad to borrow money? Absolutely not. It's a really good thing to borrow money, um, with caveats attached, I'm sure. Uh, we borrow the money. So what do we do? Um, well, you know, that's my balance sheet. It's not got a great deal on it. I'm sure there should be some numbers on there. Um, but we incur some debt. So uh, I take out a loan for 30000 That gives me cash of 30000 And then I go out and I buy a van, which costs 30000 and then that wipes out my cash. Yeah. And notice my balance sheet stays balanced. Van of 30,000 and a liability of 30,000. Yeah. So my balance sheet changes a little bit. Um, what tends to go alongside a loan? What, what, when, you, when, you incur, when you take out a loan, what, what goes with that hand in hand? Interest, unfortunately. Uh, so there's going to be some interest incurred. So there it is. Um, my income statement has grown uh, a little, by a little bit more, I've got my sales, my cost of sales, my gross profit, my depreciation, EBIT. What does EBIT stand for? 
I heard earnings. What else I heard before? Interest. Yeah, interest and tax. Earnings before interest and tax, EBIT. Other names for EBIT, operating profit. You might have seen that as well, operating profit. Uh, PBIT, profit before interest and tax. This is the really irritating thing about this world, is that there's lots of different terms for the same thing. Different terms for sales. I've used a few different ones already, I know. Revenue. Turnover. All mean the same thing. Oh, that's a, that's a great one. You won't see EBIT. Uh, so in, a, in, a, in an annual report that the auditors have signed off, they won't use the word EBIT. They'll use the word operating profit, or the term operating profit. Um, at the top, it is more variable. Um, less likely to be sales, more likely to be either turnover or revenue, to be honest with you. But what, do, what, do you, what will you guys hear internally? You'll probably hear revenue quite a bit, I would imagine, uh, and... Well, an EBIT, maybe EBIT DA, which I know is on one of those uh, post-its over there. Um, okay, then the interest comes out, and I get EBT at the bottom, so I can work this out now. If earnings, EBIT is earnings before interest in tax, EBT must be just earnings before tax, because the interest has come out now. This is suddenly becoming quite, quite easy. Don't need to worry about this too much at all. Um, what about the... The EBITDA point then. What is EBITDA? That's your, probably your question to me. What, what is EBITDA? Yeah, wonderful. So earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Yeah. Okay, I kind of know what it stands for. Um, what number would it be on this, on this slide? What's the value of EBITDA on here? 26,000. On this particular slide, it would be 26,000. Is it always the gross profit line? No. It's just that my numbers are so simple, there's not enough going on in my business. There's lots of other costs that could feature in my business, aren't there? What other costs could there be? All I've got at the moment, a cost of TV and depreciation on a van. Like labour costs because I might get my kids involved in terms of boxing up these TVs. They've, they've got very nimble hands, they'll be fine. Uh, what else could I do? So labour, diesel, diesel. Uh, so, f yeah, so fuel costs, warehouse, warehousing, yeah, that's a good one. What else? Uh, utilities, utilities. Rent, marketing, marketing costs, Repairing your, uh, great, repairs and maintenance, <laughs> my mystery machine, uh, wonderful. There are lots of other costs in my business, and where will they go? Uh, some of them will go there and increase the cost of sales, and some of them, they won't go into depreciation, but they'll be in this section, below the gross profit line. And broadly, uh, we're talking about direct costs of generating revenue going in here. Is it directly related in terms of, in, you know, to generate that revenue? Fine, we'll put it in there. If it's indirect, this is broad, uh, we'll put it down here. Okay. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, we do not need to worry about that. We just need to be able to look at some financial statements, have a broad idea of where these numbers, what these numbers mean, what they're, what they're kind of telling us. Um, okay, so that means that if we were working out EBITDA normally, what would we do? This is too easy. If you were working out EBITDA, if you had... I don't know why you'd have to do this, but if you had to work out EBITDA normally, what would you, what would you do? Where would you start? What's the first number you would take? If you look at EBITDA, what have you got? Anyone find EBIT for me? So you'd start here. Start with EBIT, because you've got four of the letters. Then go and find the D and the A and I'm conscious I haven't defined amortisation. You go and find it, and it might be there if you're very lucky in the, in the page you're looking at. You might have to go and look in some notes, and then you simply add it back. Okay? So can, tell me what amortisation is. 
I'm, I'm quite happy for you all to take away that depreciation and amortization are the same thing. There is a, there is a difference. Depreciation is on physical assets, tangible assets, um, and amortization is on intangible assets. Um, licenses, copyright, goodwill is something you'll, you'll, have, you'll have heard of. Um, but who cares? The, the, they, they have the same idea. They have the same idea. There's a bigger question, I think, because you know, some of you wrote that down in the post-it note. Um, and yes, you might have wanted to know what it stood for. Um, I hope you wrote it down because you wanted to know, well, what is it, though? Why do people use it? What's the usefulness of EBITDA? Can anyone answer that? What's the usefulness of EBITDA? Well, EBIT, uh, well, in my business, is 20,000. Do you remember what we said it was, it was different from? When we looked at my, my TV business and I asked, asked you all how much profit I'd made, lots of you gave me zero uh, and a few of you gave me 500. So some of you gave me the profit and lots of you gave me cash flow. Lots of you gave me the cash flow. So we know when we look at an income statement that EBIT is not a cash flow. It's a big problem of our income statement. It comes down to this really important number we want to analyse, but it's not a cash flow. And I really care about cash flow. So can we make it more like a cash flow? We think, let's have a quick look here. What have we got there that we know is not an actual cash flow? Depreciation is not an actual cash flow. What was the cash flow? 30,000 buying a van was a cash flow. And in the second year, there is no purchasing of a van. There's just depreciation, which is this made-up number that someone came up with on the, on the back of a, you know, a cigarette packet. So I know I've got this non-cash item. So when people use EBITDA, they are adding back a non-cash item. Yeah? Why are we doing that? To get us closer to a cash number, because a cash number could be more useful to us. If you're a lender lending money, how do you get repaid? Through profits or through cash? Through cash, right? Cash is that more important number. If you are valuing a company, in effect, you are valuing the future cash flows. So if we do the DCF question, what does DCF stand for? Do you know, Becky, what DCF stands for? <laughs> discounted cash flow. DCF is discounted cash flow. This is in our middle chart. It's off, it's off our radar, really. Discounted cash flow. When company A buys company B, uh, when Kraft comes along and wants to buy Cadbury, uh, when, when there's a, whenever, whenever there's an acquisition, the buying company has to decide how much to pay for the target company. Yeah? The acquiring company has to decide how much to pay. What you can do is make up a number. I really want, I really want it. I'll just make up a number. Or you could try and work something out. Um, well, what are you buying when you buy a company? In effect, what you're buying, what you're buying into, are the future cash flows that company's going to generate. Yeah. So I, company A buys company B because it likes it, and it thinks it's going to generate lots of cash in the future. I mean, what, why else would you do it, really? I mean, okay, I'm sure there's other reasons, brand and altruism, etc. But really, you want the cash it can generate in the future. Now, so company A could simply try and forecast what company B is going to generate next year and the year after and the year after and the year after and the year after and the year after, yeah, forever. Add all of those cash flows up and that would give you a value of the company. You could do that. The working out cash flows forever isn't easy, but you could do that. But there is a little bit of a problem built into that. Um, if I give you all a choice, would you rather have... Um, and, and let's assume you're quite wealthy already as well. You've got lots of money. Uh, but if, would you rather have £1,000 now, today, I give it to you right now, and you are wealthy, you don't need the money, or in five years' time? Greedy. When would you rather have it? Now or in five years' time? Why? It'll be worth less in five years' time. Why? Because the cost of things will increase. Yeah, because this annoying thing called inflation. Yeah. Um, so, and other reasons too, but it, 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 you, you want it, I mean, if we assume you don't need the money, but you would take it now because it's more valuable now. So what DCF does, what discounted cash flow does, um, it says 
stage one, let's work out the future cash flows that this company uh, or this project will generate. What are the future cash flows? Stage two is say, well, hang on a minute. Those future cash flows aren't worth the same money as today's cash flows. So let's discount each of those future amounts. It's just, there's a formula. We do it in Excel. You apply a formula, and it just brings down the value of each, each year's future cash flow. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's kind of, there's, a, there's a sloping line here, isn't there? A thousand pounds will be worth a thousand pounds this year, but it's maybe only worth 998 next year, 996 the next year, 994 the year after. Yeah. Does that make sense? So discounted cash flow works out the future cash flows, discounts them down, and then adds them up. And then it presents, in my M&A situation, it, it presents that uh, acquirer with a, with a figure. They say, ah, this is the value of the cash flow that, that can be generated. Therefore, that's what I'm willing to pay. Or I'll try and pay a little bit less than that. Becky, is that all right for now? I mean, w when we teach DCF, it's kind of over a couple of days. Um, but we can talk about that a bit more. Um, so EBITDA, so if I go back, actually, we stay, stay on the EBITDA. Um, we want to forecast cash flows. We want to use cash to, to analyze a business and see how business is performing. Cash flow statements, are, you know, they need a bit of effort. You have to calculate a cash flow statement. This takes very little effort. There's EBIT. Find depreciation, amortization, add them back on. It's done. It's an easy number to come up with. So if you want to look at how your business is doing, you want to do it quickly, you use EBITDA. We use EBITDA in our business. Uh, every month, uh, our CEO is able to talk to the entire business about the EBITDA that we are generating. Yeah. It will be the same in all of your businesses as well. Um, it's, a, it's a simple measure you can use uh, to see how you are doing. Yeah. It's a bit better than EBIT. It is not great, though. I don't need to walk out of here and say, oh, EBITDA is fantastic. Arguably, it's terrible. Yeah. If we're looking for a cash measure, is EBITDA cash? No, it's not. It's just one step closer than EBIT is. Yeah. Actually, you should do lots more things. Okay. Any other questions? Um, okay, so profit before, so I had underlying profit, profit, okay, they're two different things. So profit before tax is down here. Um, so everything's been taken into account except for tax. You can see what the next two lines are going to be. Tax. And what's the bottom line called these days? It could be profit after tax or earnings after tax. Net income. So you might see that term. I think someone put that on a, on a flip chart. Net income. Someone else has written something that don't quite, I, I really like, underlying profit. And that's, that's a really good one to spot. That is not a, a legal term at all. It's a made-up term that companies use to give you the profit they want to talk about. So, oh, we, you know, this, this, here's, here, here are the results for the year. But there are one or two exceptional things that have gone on, some, some, uh, some one-off items in here uh, that you can't really see. So what we could do is we could adjust our profit to give you the underlying profit. This is, this is really how we've done if you take into account these unusual things that have happened. Now, on the one hand, you can be cynical and say, well, yeah, but what are you taking out? What are these things that you think are unusual? I might not agree with you. And on the other hand, you might think, actually, that's really sensible. I don't want you to take into account that you know, there was a flood this year and that affected your business. When I analyse your business and think about how you're going to perform, I need to know what's normal, normal business. Yeah. Because you know, when, in financial services, you think about um, the future and where, where it's headed. Yeah. Um, so I've net income after tax. So just net income, I think, I'd get you to, to, to take away, which would be two lines below there. Uh, I've got EBITDA. Are we comfortable with EBITDA then? Do you think? You can chat to me afterwards if, if less so. And I've got lots of P&L and balance sheet. Although, how would you feel about P&L and balance sheet? P&L, so income statement is the term you're going to walk out with. Um, the, think about the, it's a, a, over a period of time, usually a year, it's the revenue and the expenses. Yeah? It's the revenue that you've earned, it's the expenses you've incurred. Revenue earned, expenses incurred over a period of time. That's our income statement. Um, and our balance sheet, uh, I think Suki told us about the snapshot, the snapshot of assets and liabilities. And that will do. I think we, could, we, we know what an asset is. We know what liabilities are. And liabilities, I, I know I didn't use the word equity, 
but that's okay. Equity is, is, the, is the money that people have given us. It's in the business. In a way, I kind of owe them. So it's a kind of a liability. So a snapshot of assets and liabilities. At any one moment in time, what assets have we got? What liabilities have we got? Is that okay? General ledger. Um, the general ledger, all that is, is what the accountants use to record every single financial transaction that happens in the business. Because um, when you think about this, you know, these are very high level numbers, but when something happens, how does it get recorded? So, you know, in your firms, there'll be different accounting packages used, SAGE and, and whatever else. Um, so someone raises an invoice, uh, a bill comes in, someone makes a sale, uh, someone uses petty cash, uh, someone claims expenses. Every time there is a transaction, you put in entries into, uh, into the general ledger, debits and credits. Yeah. Cash has gone out and expense has gone up. So, so the general ledger will be thousands of lines long, and then your poor finance teams have to take that and compress it into something like this. It's kind of done automatically, but there'll be adjustments as well. So don't feel too sorry for them. They chose that life. Um, any other kind of accounting type question before I move into my, my middle area of grenades, really? Go on. Here we go. Here's my van at 30,000 right now. Um, when I start depreciating, de depreciating it, I'll depreciate it by 6,000 a year. So intuitively, next year, what, that, what will that van appear at in my balance sheet? What will the number be? Wonderful. 24,000. So in a sense... The depreciation is there in reducing the cost of my, of my asset. You don't see it, though. You won't see it on the balance sheet. You'll just see van, 24,000. Uh, wonderful. Um, it doesn't, actually. And it, you, you, you may or may not like this. Um, and this is where we need much longer than an hour. What happens is your equity goes down. Um, actually, I can, kind of, I can explain this. So down in equity, there's a line called... Uh, retained earnings or retained profits and what that is doing is it's capturing all of the profits that this business generates so every time I sell a TV and make a profit and generate some well further down earnings uh, after tax yeah my net income every time I generate that it gets scooped up and it goes into my retained earnings so if I've got depreciation that's higher depreciation goes up my returned earnings goes down so that actually goes down by six thousand yeah, that goes out. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, that takes more time. We need to look at the actual double entry and what's going on, but I don't think you want to do that. And it would, it would take a lot longer. Or, we, or you tell Alice that you do want to do it and we come back again another, another time. Um, does, that, does that answer your question, Sophie? Yes. Yeah? For now, at least. Uh, any other kind of balance sheet, income statement, cash flow type questions? Terms that you've seen, heard, anything that I've, any terms that I've used today? Um, reporting losses and gains on securities um, is quite a complex area, actually. And if you want it, we could do the technical accounting, but not, not today. It depends. It depends what, what, what they're being used for, why they're being held by the business. So the asset will be there on the balance sheet. So the securities themselves will be here. So I think we talked about investments. But we have to ask ourselves, well, why are we holding on to them? Are they for the long term? Are they for the short term? Are they there for hedging purposes? There's lots of different reasons why they might be there, stuff we can't really get into today. Um, and that will determine where that loss goes. Yeah. So once we know the reason, it, it will determine it. But often there is an impact on the income statement. So I'm holding some securities, some financial securities. They lose value, they gain value. Yeah, foreign exchange losses and gains. Now, we try and keep foreign exchange losses and gains out of here and just in a separate note because you think, well, you know, that's not really part of the activity. I, it just, I just so happen to be trading with an entity in a different country or I just so happen to have assets in a different country. We try and keep those movements out of here and in a separate note. But they, they do feature in the accounts. Yeah. We try and keep this clean. You know, what's the story of the business? Not well, what's gone on with the FX markets. Try and keep that out. Uh, so DCF we did, uh, lots of people have said derivatives, which is 
which I think we've got to do a different event on. Um, let me just define a derivative for you, because we can do that quite easily-ish. Oh, it's not fair. I want to ask you what you think a derivative is. If you Google it, uh, you get a really awful definition along the lines of, I don't know, a contract between two parties, um, uh, and the contract has a value, and that value is based on an underlying asset. Full stop. Oh, great, that's really helpful. Really, really appreciate that. So you've got to kind of forget that uh, and try and break it down. So a derivative or is a contract, is a piece of paper, it's an agreement. Sometimes it's a bet between two parties. Um, and there are lots of different types. If I, if I, if I use words like um, options, I've heard of an option, uh, or forwards or futures, heard of, these are all derivatives. They have a value... Um, and they're based on something else. They're all connected to something else, aren't they? They're connected to some other asset. Gold, oil, a share price. So um, we could enter into a, a kind of a bet. Becky and I could uh, enter into a, a derivative with each other. Um, I could agree to sell you um, some gold for uh, $1,000 per ounce. Um, and you are agreeing to buy gold for $1,000 per ounce. And we set a date. Um, we set a date of uh, the 3rd of April. Okay? So on that date, um, you're going to buy gold from me at $1,000 per ounce. Okay? Just a, an agreement between us. Um, so hopefully it's very clear that on that day, in effect, one of us is going to be a winner and one of us is going to be a loser. Why? Go on. Yeah, brilliant. In the meantime, gold prices will change. So we'll know on the day whether one of us is getting a good deal or not. Becky's locked in $1,000 uh, per ounce of gold as, a, as her price. Um, if the market price is $1,500, is Becky happy or sad? Becky's buying. Is she happy or sad? If the market price is $1,500 and she's able to buy for 1000 she's pretty happy. Me? I'm pretty sad. <laughs> I'm always quite sad. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sad about that. Um, okay, so on that date we can see what's happening. We can see what this contract is doing. But why is it a derivative? If we look the day before, the day before, we can see what gold prices are doing. They're edging up towards 1500 This contract, this piece of paper um, between us, let's say um, Becky doesn't want the gold. She doesn't want the gold on the 3rd of April. If, if that was the date I said. She doesn't want that gold anymore. What could, what could Becky do? She could sell that piece of paper to somebody else. How does the somebody else decide whether that piece of paper is valuable or not? What would they look at? Look at the price of gold, wouldn't you? So Becky's allowed to buy uh, gold for $1,000 an ounce. Market price, $1,450. That piece of paper is quite valuable. How much might you pay for that piece of paper? Let's say the market price is fourteen fifty. Go on, up uh, anything up to fourteen fifty. Would you pay fourteen fifty one? You m excellent, excellent, because it's it, it it's the following day, isn't it? So if you think the price is going to keep going up, and to, and tomorrow is the day when you have to buy that gold, not today. You might still buy that. You might still have value. Uh, would you pay 1600 or 1700 1800 It's going to get less and less likely. Um, so you're going to work out the value. So the piece of paper now has a value based on an underlying asset, based on gold. It's deriving its own value based on something else. Does that make sense? So that, that is a derivative. It's a, it's a bet between us, uh, a contract between us, and it has actually got some value. You can sell derivatives. Yeah, we, we sell, well, I mean you can sell them on. You can obviously sell derivatives. You can sell them on. Okay. Uh, and I think I saw the terms OTC somewhere. Oh, it might have been over, oh, probably on one of those. What does OTC stand for? Over the counter. Over the counter as opposed to exchange traded. So what's the difference between the two? Yeah, wonderful. And if it's a contract between individuals, it becomes bespoke. We can, we can, you know, Becky and I can really discuss the terms and the arrangements, and it can be very narrow and very bespoke. Uh, exchange traded, there are standardised 
contracts out there, set amounts, set terms, uh, and we can, you can just buy and sell those immediately. Yeah. There's, there's no need to involve a, a middle party. Uh, so I've got several, several with le the word leverage in, LBO, so leverage buyout, LBO, leverage buyout, we've got leverage finance and leverage. Leverage is basically borrowing money. If you increase your leverage, you are increasing your indebtedness, you are borrowing more money. Uh, so think about that balance sheet, more debt, more cash. Um, and the rest of it is about buying a business. What you can use that cash for, you're going to buy a business. Yeah, so the, 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 the BO, the buyout business element of it, is we're going to raise finance, raise external finance, and then we're going to complete a purchase as a result. Okay? So you're raising debt to complete the purchase of a business. And that's, a, that's an enormous topic on, it, on its own. That's, that's a couple of days' worth. Uh, you know, where, you know, in, in a valuation context, you would, um, you'd, br you'd build a model to work out what would be the, what's the impact of borrowing money to buy that business? Is it sensible? It might mean you've then got so much debt and so much interest, it's a very bad idea to buy that business. Yeah. So you model this out. Uh, Basel III, whoever put that in is very cool. Um, Basel III, in a nutshell, that's probably a half a day or a day. Um, so banks, we like banks to lend, we, so therefore we like banks to take a bit of risk. Um, but we also want banks to be cautious and careful. We don't want them to take too much risk. So maybe if I draw this. Um, so this is going to be a picture of a balance sheet with assets and liabilities. Liabilities. Where does a bank get its, get its money from? Where does a bank get its money from? Customers in the form of deposits. Where else does a bank get its money from? So quite a lot of deposits, I reckon. How, how, how does any company get money? E wonderful. Equity. Not a lot, to be honest with you. Bit of equity. Uh, okay, good. And that goes into equity. So, when they, so uh, it will earn interest, and that will boost the equity. What's this middle bit here? Um... Uh, so, that's, so if they're investing in the bank, that's in equity, I suppose. Where does any business get, its, get, can get, can get money from? Where, where do your businesses... Yeah, other banks. So they are loans. So loans from banks and from central banks. Yes, yeah, so they're borrowing money, borrowings. So now I've got a bank with loads and loads of cash. Remember my balance sheet has to balance. So I've got all this external finance, loads and loads of cash. What does the bank do with that money? Pay out in bonuses. No. Uh, what it, invest, it. invest it. So you might invest it in, uh, I don't know. Okay, let's call it investments. Equities, gold. There yeah, might be some investments. What else? Lend, Lend it. There's going to be lots there that uh, loans to customers. What sometimes happens when a bank lends a customer money? Most of the time the customer pays. Sometimes. What's that? Sometimes a customer doesn't pay, and there's a default. So some of these loans to customers go bad. So if I scrub those out, they've now gone bad. Now the balance sheet has to balance. So someone on the right-hand side has to take that loss. How do we feel about them taking that loss? Us, I mean. That's bad, isn't it? We do not want to lose out because the bank has lent. So we've got to protect these at all, at all costs. What happens if they take the loss? That's less bad than that. But that's not great either. Why is that bad if they take a loss? What's going to happen? Uh, yeah, good. And also, if you are that other bank lending money, you're not going to want to do that anymore. So think about the credit crunch. What was that all about? That was banks not having the confidence to lend to each other. So it's going to create that situation again. So the group that has to take it are the shareholders. Shareholders we know are the ones who are meant to take the most risk. So it's the shareholders that must be that buffer. So what Basel is all about is making sure that that buffer is big enough. And Basel III has basically pushed the line up a bit. I mean, hopefully you know I'm massively oversimplifying this. Um, but what, so what Basel does is it makes sure there's a buffer. It calculates a buffer. It's a percentage of what's over here. And Basel III makes that line a bit higher. And it, and it phases it in over the next 
uh, what year, 2014, uh, four years. Okay, it's, it's being phased in uh, one year at a time. Okay. Is that okay for now? <laughs> I kind of want you to say, yeah, that's fine. Uh, VAR, value at risk. I'm definitely not going to do that now. Uh, an insurance term, uh, typically. Um, but it's a measure of risk. It's a, it's a way of actually calculating risk. Now, this is a really hot topic. Um, oh, you know, we, we're undertaking this activity. And we're therefore taking on risk in our business. But how do you quantify that? So VAR is a calculation. It's a method of quantifying, put a number to uh, a risk metric. Okay. I, I can't really say any more on that uh, now, I'm afraid. And FX was the last one. I will ask whoever put FX to come and chat to me, uh, and then I will try and narrow down uh, what, what you wanted to know on FX, because it's, it's a huge topic. I won't ask you to analyze Tesco and Walmart. I would love you to. Maybe that can be homework, because uh, we're out of time.